the law incapable of fulfillment. We must briefly confirm and explain our statement that to keep the law is impossible, for it would seem so absurd an idea that Jerome does not hesitate to condemn it as wicked. I am not concerned about the reason which led him to do this. It should be enough if we grasp the simple truth, nor will I draw important distinctions about various classes of possibility. I call impossible what has never been seen, and what, by God's word and ordinance, will never be. I contend that however far back we go, from time immemorial, not one of the saints, while in the prison of this mortal body, ever possessed such perfect love as to love God with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his strength. I contend further that not one remained unspotted by some kind of evil craving. Now who will deny that? I am well aware of how the superstitious view the saints, as men of such purity that the angels in heaven can scarcely rival them. That, however, is contrary both to scripture and experience. I assert more strongly still that there will never be anyone who achieves the goal of perfection until he is freed from his body. This is proved by many obvious testimonies in scripture. In dedicating the temple, Solomon claimed that there is not a man on earth who does not sin. David declared that no man living will be justified in God's sight. That saying, too, is often repeated in the book of Job. Paul makes the same point more plainly than all the rest. The flesh, he writes, lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. To prove that all are accursed who are under the law, he reasons only from the fact that it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not remain obedient to the commandments. By this he means, or rather states as an absolute fact, that no one is capable of maintaining obedience. Now whatever scripture proclaims must be taken as forever true and even as necessary. The Pelagians used to attack Augustine with this kind of clever argument. He, to escape their slurs, admitted that the Lord could indeed, if he wished, exalt a mortal man to angelic perfection, but that he had never done so, nor would he in the future, because his word said otherwise. I do not deny what Augustine says, but I would add that it makes no sense to oppose God's power to his truth. Thus no one, I maintain, can quarrel with the statement that whatever our Lord declared was impossible is impossible. Should some still wish to dispute this idea, we have the word of Jesus Christ who, when asked by his disciples who could be saved, replied that with men it was impossible, but that with God all things are possible. Augustine shows with sound reasons that we never in this present life give to God the love we owe him. Love, he writes, proceeds from knowledge in such a way that no one can perfectly love God who has not first experienced his goodness. Now as long as we are pilgrims here on earth, we know it only dimly as in a mirror. So it follows that the love which we bear him is imperfect. Let us be absolutely certain, then, that we cannot fulfil the law while ever we live in this world, as Paul elsewhere demonstrates. <laughs>